Warning, the following video contains strong language which may be offensive to some viewers and or inappropriate for children. The content within this video is intended for mature audiences only. I have a short story of an experience I had as an 18-year-old teenager in the mountains of Colorado. I was in a remote area by Steamboat Springs. I think the year was 1987 and it was spring. I was camping by a river in an old broken down cabin that belonged to a friend's family. One morning I decided to go trout fishing and enjoy the morning air and what nature has to offer. I was not at all prepared as to what I was about to see. I started to trout fish when a pebble or something hit the water in front of me. Thinking about this is giving me goosebumps as I speak, and I'm 53 now. Anyhow, I kind of dismissed the idea of it being a pebble, because maybe some fish had started to hit the top of the water. Again, another pebble was thrown into the water, and this time I figured it was coming from a tree across the river by a squirrel or something. Still, I figured it was nothing to worry about. It was then about that time I noticed there were no birds chirping or doing what birds do. I noticed it was dead silent other than the breeze and the water making noise. I knew there were bear in the area, but all I had with me was a little 410 shotgun. I knew this was not enough to kill a bear, but maybe deter it long enough for me to get back to the cabin. It was about this time I noticed movement up on the rocky slope with pine trees. I saw something with reddish brown hair and it got up and started to move across the hill. When I say it got up, I mean it stood up. At first, I thought it was a couple of bears that were together, and both were standing up to get something out of a tree. I could just feel something was off, so I started to walk back toward the cabin with my little cap gun in tow, and it was then I realized it was not two bears standing up together. It was one big creature, and it was looking at me. You know, I hunt and have hunted all my life, and when I think about it now, I know what I saw was not fake. When you hunt and you've been around enough animals, you look at their eyes and their demeanor. This creature was most definitely real. He or she or it had my attention, and we both knew it. The funny thing is, it wasn't really showing aggression, but just letting me know, hey, I'm here, you're in my spot. Or maybe it was just curious about me and what I was doing. I never turned my back on the creature, and even though it was across the river, I decided I had enough and started walking backwards, never taking my eyes off the thing. I stumbled over rocks and stumps to get back to the cabin, because I was basically walking backwards. It never left, and just watched me walk away. I got back to the cabin, and my friend who was still sleeping asked me where I went. I told him and told him what I saw, and thought we should go. At first, I was reluctant to tell him because of the ridicule, but as I told him, he did not look surprised, and he said, they have always been here, and they have never bothered anyone before. Don't use my name. You can use my story if you want. Sorry for the typos. I did this on my phone, and as a healthcare worker, it's hard to find time to do things these days. Take care, and please, please understand, sometimes the people who need the proof are the ones who have experienced something and they are the ones who are asking for proof for themselves to know they are not crazy. One thing is certain, I live in rural Missouri now, and I love to hunt, but when I do, I lock and load as soon as I start walking. If I ever see one here, I will quit hunting and sell my small farm. Thank you for your time. Something I do to deal with stress is to write a story about these issues or events. The majority of this story I composed a while ago. You probably have heard lots of similar stories to this, but for what it's worth, here it is. Sorry if this is a little long. I would like to start by saying I'm a person that loves hunting, fishing, and the outdoors. I have spent the majority of my life as an amateur adventurer. I'm now retired, but worked at the same job for 40 years. My staff, co-workers, and most of my superiors came to me to share stories and concerns or as a sounding board, because I always try and see all sides of an argument and usually can work towards a win-win conclusion. I'm a very rational person, so why do I have three memories while out in the bush that I cannot explain, and why do they haunt me to this day? The first time I can remember being afraid in the bush, I was with my family and we were staying in a little campground beside a stream located about halfway between Canmore and Banff. 
Sadly, the campground is no longer there. I was 12 or 13 and already very comfortable on my own in the bush. There was a well-worn trail that followed the stream back up the mountain, so I decided to take the hike to see what lay back there. I was probably about 20 minutes in, and the bush was lush, green, and very thick, but I also noted, very quiet. All of a sudden, it was like someone was talking to me. No sound, but an energy was coming from just up ahead, and I could clearly hear words in my mind, something telling me that I was not wanted there. I remember thinking, what or who are you? I received an immediate response, leave now. The energy was dark, and it terrified me. I turned and ran back along the path. About halfway back, the energy was gone. It left me with a lifelong memory. I was now in my early 30s and bow hunting elk in a mountain valley running east from Meadow Creek in B.C. It was closer to the end of the day, and I was starting down the mountain heading back to camp, trying to be stealthy, walking along about halfway down the mountain, when there was a wave of energy that hit me like a brick. The energy was very dark, and it scared me. At this point in my life, not much scares me, but that did. So I forgot about the hunt and took off at double pace. After about a quarter mile farther down the mountain, the energy was gone. I remember telling myself, what in the hell was that? Ironically, about another quarter mile farther along, I did have a grizzly bear encounter with a mother and cub that I managed to talk my way out of. But that's another story. Late that night, I replayed the events of that day over and over in my head, and it finally struck me that I remembered that same energy from the trail walk when I was young. It was like you would remember a nightmare. Now I was in my late 40s and elk hunting along the North Saskatchewan River in the Fort Ullacorn Forest Reserve in my home province of Saskatchewan. It was a very cloudy day with the threat of rain, and after hunting along for about three hours, I came upon a huge hillside of blueberries and decided to sit down for a while and have a snack. I must have been crawling around for the better part of half an hour or so, just enjoying the fruits of nature, when boom, it hit me again. I know that dark energy. I jumped up and spun around. I saw nothing, but there was no mistaking the thoughts and feelings. This time, I was determined to stick it out, thinking that this was all in my head. I could feel where the energy was coming from, so I surveyed the area closely. What I could see was a very bright spot of light on a bush. This was very unsettling, as there was heavy cloud cover. After what seemed to be an hour, but probably only minutes, trying to face my fear, I heard a heavy thump to my right. I looked over towards the sound, but could see nothing. I looked back again to where the energy was coming from. The spot of light had moved. I heard a second thump to my right again, but much closer this time. Looking over, I saw a large bowling ball-sized rock rolling to a stop in the grass. Now that was tangible evidence that something was not okay. I could no longer see any bright spots of light, but decided that there was something definitely wrong there, and backed out with my rifle at the ready. Again, a little ways down the trail, the energy was gone. Thinking about these events have led to many sleepless nights. How do I come to terms with these memories? The only thing I have to go on are the thoughts and feelings of the so-called energy. But now to add to that, the spots of light and a couple of rather large rocks, I think, were thrown. How do you rationalize all of this? Now in my 60s, I still hunt and love the outdoors, always eager to learn something I may not know or hear stories from fellow outdoor enthusiasts. I approached the Bigfoot stories with skepticism, but the elementals of the stories started to fit for me. Thank you. Larry Brower I'm a hermit. I live alone deep in the woods of the North Carolina hills. Being a combat veteran with PTSD, the peace and solitude of the woods are a true blessing for me. I'm off the grid and try to live quietly and peacefully. In trying to raise a garden is when I first came into the Bigfoot world. My garden would be destroyed when it was time to harvest. I found some prints and did not know what to think about them. They were large, 16 to 18 inch tracks. After educating myself, I also learned to my surprise about these tree structures and limb breaks. 
The woods around me are full of these. I had thought it was winter snow loads. My first encounter was late one night when I went to retrieve clothes off the line. And behind the line was this huge creature. I took a deep inhale, a panicked one, and peed all over myself in shock. I turned and fled into the cabin. I heard a crashing through the woods, leaving me. I was so shook up, I took an extra dose of my medicine for PTSD to calm down. I then would stay up all night and would sleep during the day. I gradually became rational and began to read a lot and did more education on Bigfoot and gave up gardening. I was outside in my front yard a couple of weeks after that and started to get pebbles thrown at me. I picked up a small rock and threw it back in that direction and yelled out. It responded with a whoop. Later that day, after a trip to get groceries, I came home. I found a large feather on my front porch, with prints leading up to the porch and going away. I was perplexed as to what to do, so I saw where people would leave marbles or something shiny to trade or gift. I sure as hell was not going to leave food. Over a period of time, I increased the distance from my house to the gifting area. I have left mushrooms, sticks, a half-eaten squirrel, rocks, you name it. I began to realize if I left it alone, it would leave me alone. The gifting stopped and I was relieved, thinking it had left the area. This was in early spring. Through the spring and summer of that year, all was peaceful and quiet. Hunting season rolled around and I have to repeatedly run people off and take down stands. I cannot stand the sound of gunfire or renegade hunters spotlighting deer on my property. During this time in October, I was sitting on my front porch shelling beans one night and heard a whoop. I ignored it and it whooped again. I still ignored it. This time it was much closer and louder. Out of frustration, I raised my head up and said, All right, I hear ya. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement. One was about 30 to 40 yards away and moved out like lightning away from me. These creatures are tall, kind of thinner, and black colored hair. For some reason, I was somewhat concerned, but not in a state of shock like my first time. I was still extremely cautious. I began to wonder why did it react like that? Did it want me to know it was here? Just about every time I went outside, it would whoop. Our newspaper in this area is weekly and struggles to find enough news to publish. A couple of farmers that were a few miles away had reported missing hogs and chickens, and the barn where feed was kept was broken into. I know the farmer. He was my new supplier of fresh vegetables. In speaking with him, he told me he had shot at a would-be robber near the same barn days before, and was concerned because one of the hogs was 300 plus pounds. He saw no tire tracks, and the pen was locked and surrounded by a four-foot fence. He could not figure it out, as a bear would kill and consume it on sight. I began to put two and two together. The other farmer had 20-something chickens missing with a trail of feathers heading into the woods. The encounter I had last year was one I will never forget. Being in a rural environment, surrounded by national forests and large farms, makes this area ideal for marijuana growers. I noticed over a period of several weeks, a car was parked about a half to three-quarters of a mile down the road from my driveway from time to time. One evening around dusk, I heard distant voices and saw some lights in the woods. Thinking this to be hunters scouting on an area, I headed towards them. My intention was to stop this before it started. I came upon a field of marijuana with tripwires and camera traps. I disarmed the tripwires and took down the cameras, pulled up the plants, and left them there. This was too close to my property, and this county only has one deputy on patrol per shift. Two days later, I hear a bunch of hell raising going on in that same area. I slowly came up and got close enough to see four guys walking around their pot garden, furious as to what had happened. I saw no weapons, so I hollered out to them to get out of my woods. They became verbally hostile and challenged me to appear, so I did. I was armed with my knife only. These guys slowly, in conversation, began to circle me and started to be aggressive. Preparing for the worst, I was ready to defend myself from this bunch when a loud deep bark or growl sounded off. These guys got wide-eyed and scared as children. They looked at me and said, What is that? I calmly smiled and said, You don't want to know. With almost perfect timing, a large log landed behind them, and they ran out of those woods so fast, it was hilarious. 
I turned and faced that direction and said, thank you, and went home. I have and still keep a diary of these and other encounters, and in going through my notes and certain articles I kept, I have come to several facts with my encounters and experiences. These creatures were here and will be here around my property long before and after I am gone. They are Mother Nature's ultimate predator. They have intelligence, personalities, and attitudes like other humans. They are opportunistic eaters, the easy way to free meals. They do not tolerate competition for food, hunters. They know your intent. That's why I'm still alive. They see me as no threat to them. They have seen me run off other humans, so maybe they feel I'm as territorial as they are. I dwell on peace and quiet and solitude. They do not cloak or mind speak. They are not extraterrestrial. Just a highly intelligent creature that is trying to survive and like myself, understand that humans are the most selfish and destructible threat to their existence. I do know they will kill if provoked or pursued. If you pursue them, you are playing a game that only they can win. And lastly, they are cannibalistic. I am sure this fall I will hear that familiar whoop, and I will protect them as they have protected me. I am an older man with absolutely no desire for notoriety, money, or any ego-based glory. Respect is the key. All the best. The creature was wearing a tracking collar. My story is short, just like the period of time I had eyes on the animal. It's 13 years ago, early spring in the Everglades, a trip I had made for six previous years. There's no place in North America where you can replicate the experiences you'll have in the areas along the Miccosukee River. My friend and I also fish the hardest places to get access to, for the obvious reasons. The areas we fish are mainly canals and are split up or separated by weirs, a super shallow area 30 to 40 feet wide between canals where you can pull a boat through but not drive across. I was pulling my boat, a 16-foot John boat, and my buddy Joe was standing up in the boat on gator watch. With that said, if Joe made any kind of noise, motion, or gesture, I would be in that boat in less than a second. That's what happened. Joe was trying to get a word out, but couldn't make his mouth, vocal cords, or something work. Now I'm in the boat, and Joe points to the bank, where an animal, or creature, stands with a small alligator in its right hand, maybe 40 yards away. In two steps, it was out of sight in the thick, low brush. This wasn't a seven or eight foot tall thing, more like less than six. Muscular, with balls of reddish hair hanging on it, as if there had been more that had already fallen off, maybe shedding. Joe told me, when he first spotted it, it had an alligator leg in its left hand and was eating it. Now for the part that keeps us from telling others about the day that changed both of our lives. We both could see a thick collar of some kind around its neck. It looked to be metal with leather, not 100% sure what it was made of, as some of it was covered with neck hair. We both believe it was a tracking collar. I, I have searched the internet for years now and never came across an encounter like ours. Have you? My hope is, if you share this, others may come forward that have seen the same thing. If there was a prayer of the animal being a bear or an escaped monkey... Whatever, I wouldn't be wasting your time. This was definitely the same animal others have spotted in South Florida that they call Swamp Ape. That was our last trip to the Everglades, and within a year or so, we stopped fishing and hunting together and rarely talked. Warning, this next video has very harsh language. Summer 1990, late July to be exact. My brother and I decided to try our favorite smallmouth creek at night for flathead catfish, something we have done many times on our home river some 40 miles south. Night started off usual, dusk, semi-dark, total darkness. We always fished bare bones at night, single, small, handheld, cheapo flashlights. My brother was half asleep, no matter, in fishing he can do whatever. Across the creek, approximately 30 to 40 yards, Something very fucking large came slamming through the thickest shit around, like it was charging me, as I was closest to the bank. My brother sat up a bit, and I asked him if he heard that, and he agreed he did. Being me, I started chucking rocks in the area of the action. 
one after the other, thinking it was one of the landowner's cows that wandered off. It got quiet, like really fucking quiet. At that exact moment, a large rock came and landed close enough to me to get me pretty wet. What the fuck? So, being me again, I began throwing bigger rocks in that direction. Yeah, I know, genius. That didn't last but two rocks, when another large rock hit damn near at my feet as I was in the water at this point, ready to go. Then a large, fast, powerful woof, like nothing I've ever heard, came at me. My brother was in the car at this point, yelling at me, Let's get the fuck out of here now! It then began to fucking bark like a damn dog. But you could tell it wasn't a damn dog at all. I was paralyzed at this point, not having a clue what this thing was. Better senses came over me after about 30 seconds or so, and I retreated like the flailing human I am. Next day, I was out there at 7 a.m. to see what the fuck. Yeah, that's just me. The rocks this asshole threw weren't rocks. They were fucking cinder blocks. One full, one was half a one. Cinder blocks, 40 yards. I went across the creek, this area I knew well, as it was a hot spot for large bass for me. The thicket it came through was seven feet tall, and you couldn't see through it at all. The path was clear where Mr. or Mrs. Asshole plowed through. Not totally clear, but doable, and behind this thicket were two dead whitetails, one seemingly fresh and one well-eaten. I know why he was pissed off now, or she, I suppose. Never saw the fucker, and I'm thankful I didn't. I know full well what it was. Nothing in Indiana can do shit like that. My name is James Farrell, and I'm from Michigan. I've hunted all my life. I've taken a hundred deer or so with my bow. I've also got many coyotes and foxes. I know my animals. I was hunting in Irish Shields, or Brooklyn. Either way, I was hunting a big swamp. My brother told me not to hunt there by myself. Still, when you're young, you don't listen. I was chasing a nice buck for six days. My father-in-law shot at him from a stand. I put them in a wide mass of 12-point, 160 class. I wanted him badly. I went in around 5.30 a.m. and set up on a valley that had a creek that ran through it. I saw what I thought was a coyote peering over the ridge. I watched as this thing came crawling on its belly over the ridge. As it slowly moved down, I noticed that it was not a coyote. The hair on my neck rose. It then dropped into the creek line. My mind said, what was that? I watched and I saw a head pop up 15 yards down the creek. I saw that it was looking right at me. It sent chills through my body as we made eye contact with each other. It sprang and leaped across the creek and pulled itself up with its arms and ran off on two feet. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. I stayed in my tree till around 10, climbed down and got the hell out of there. I don't know what I saw, but I can tell you it was not human. It had the ability to know I was there. It looked like a young black child with no clothes on. I have a new perception of what's out there. Thanks for letting me tell my story. James. Hello, my name is Thomas. I'm 53 years old and grew up hunting in the swamps of Louisiana and fishing inshore and offshore. Back when I was 19, a friend of mine, Rob and I, used to go out shining deer and hogs. Yeah, I know it was against the law, but we still went out there and did it anyway. It's an excellent way to get some quick meat for the freezer. One night we were hunting behind the Stennis Space Center, an area known as the Honey Island Swamp, right across the state line in Mississippi. We would park on the road and walk down the swamp on both sides. We can usually snipe a hog or a deer crossing the roads. This one night, we parked the car like we typically do, an old piece of shit Pinto hatchback. We both had 12-gauge shotguns and big-ass lights on our heads, and mag lights taped to the shotgun barrels. As we were walking down the road one night, all of a sudden, something started matching our steps off the tree line in the swamp. I would hear... Two feet walking through the swamp. We would shine the light in the swamp to see where the noise was coming from. It was inside the tree line out of our range of sight, even with the big fucking light on our heads and the two mag lights taped to the shotgun barrels. We always had the plugs out of our shotguns, shooting three-inch double-aught buck magnums. 
with an additional couple of boxes of stuff in our pockets. If whatever it was would have walked on the road, or we would have seen it, it would have got the shit knocked out of it. Down the road about a mile and a half, we stopped at a big turnaround, just staring in the swamp with our lights on, trying to figure out what the fuck was in there. It was pacing back and forth in front of us. We could not see what it was, and we didn't want to waste ammo blind shooting. About this time, my fear started getting the best of me, and I started farting my ass off. It may sound funny, but when you're getting the shit scared out of you, you start farting your fucking ass off. Whatever it was, never made a sound, never made a roar, never made a growl, never made a noise. We just heard footsteps. At this point, we both said, fuck this shit and we started walking back towards the car, with this fucker still pacing us in the swamp. We got to maybe 200 yards from the car, then the splish-splash stopped. As luck would have it, as we were turning the Pinto around, it got stuck in a ditch. We had to get the jack out, one of those old steel bumper jacks, put it on the bank of the ditch, jack on the bumper, pushing the front end out of the ditch. We had to do this a few times to get out. Must have taken a half hour, maybe longer. The whole time, we were waiting for something to pop out of the swamp and gobble our ass up. We never went back to that part of the swamp again. I brought this up with my partner Rob a couple of weeks ago, and he still remembers it like it was yesterday. I told him it was Bigfoot. He says to me, I'm crazy. If anybody wants to believe the story, they can believe it. Anybody that doesn't want to believe it doesn't have to. I don't care. I just wanted to share the story with you. Still hunting the woods, not scared. I do more fishing now than hunting offshore in my boat out of Venice, Louisiana. My name is B.W. Let me tell you about myself. I grew up in the piney woods of East Texas and came from a family that has a long history of hunters, as in that's all we did, hunt and fish. My great-great-grandfather was one of the last hunters to harvest a black bear in East Texas, back when they still had bears to hunt there. I served in the U.S. Marines, was a deputy sheriff afterwards for a short time, and after two years decided that wasn't for me. Then after a lifetime spent in the woods, decided that the guiding life was for me, and have been a full-time hunting guide for the last 33 years. I started in Montana, guiding for everything from deer to bighorns, back when you could still buy a tag over the counter, and I have had a long career back home in Texas. The first time I had seen one of these things, I was five years old. We hunted deer back then the old south way, with hounds and shotguns loaded with buckshot. It was a very cool and bright morning, and the hunters were lined up a power line right away that cut through the property. The property was located in the Sabine River bottom in Panola County, Texas. Anyway, the hunters were spaced about 200 yards apart down the right-of-way, waiting on the dogs to run a buck their way. My father picked the end of the line down by a high-water slough that crossed the right-of-way. He put me in the bed of the pickup and told me to stay put, and he walked about 50 yards up the line to wait on the dogs to run a deer. We heard the dogs strike, and he moves about 25 yards further down. I noticed movement in the tree line down by the slough, and at first thought it was a deer, but it was too dark in color and it ran out on two legs. It must have been a young one because it was only five to six feet tall. In my juvenile mind, I thought, why is a man running around in a full-length fur coat? Two things that I remember vividly is he was holding his leg while running, like you see in the old westerns when the cowboy had been shot, skipping and limping, and the second thing he was fast, too fast for a man to be running with a hurt leg. I yelled at my dad to see, and when I turned around, it was gone. Later that morning, I told what I saw and was chided, and told I would be seeing pink elephants next. From the time I was old enough to hunt by myself, I'd been whistled at, pine cones thrown at me, tree knocking, I found saplings woven together or snapped, heard calls, so much so that I thought it was the part of the way the woods were. It wasn't until I saw the second one that made the world change. I was sitting in a tree stand about a mile and a half from my first encounter, 17 years old and an old hand at being in the woods, or so I thought at the time. Getting to be magic time on an overcast day, woods were dead quiet, nothing moving, 
when all of a sudden, in the cane thicket in front of me, a sweet gum tree started to shake violently. The tree was about eight inches across at the part I could see over the cane and was whipping like you would see a small young sapling. Then it roared a deep guttural sound that vibrated in my body. I had been charged by wounded buffalo, had an elephant kick dirt on me, but I have never been as afraid in my life as I was that day. I was in shock. I couldn't move. I was frozen. He shook the tree again. I was so afraid I jumped out of the stand and shot into the air because all I could think about was, I don't want to piss it off anymore and I don't have enough gun. I could hear it running through the thicket away from me, so I jumped on my three-wheeler and floored it. I haven't been back to that place since. You talk about being aware of your surroundings, a sixth sense, and you're right on the money. I've been a lot of places throughout the years, and it's went off, and I don't stay in those places. My brother had an encounter when he was 13 that he won't talk about and won't go to the woods alone anymore. B.W. Me and my family had moved to the Montgomery County area in Texas in October of 2001. In December, I had noticed an old logging road leading into the Sam Houston National Forest from the subdivision, which was still under development at the time. I haven't hiked since I was a teenager, so I decided to see where this road went when weather permitted. April 2002, I had taken some vacation time from work, and one afternoon after mowing, I thought I would go for a walk, a routine I continued for several days, going further down the road and deeper into the woods with each trek. I had seen evidence of deer, hog, squirrel, and even bear in the area. On the sixth day, I walked by an area that had springs on both sides of the trail, which alternated sides every so often. I noticed on this trip there was no animal sounds or activity, and I felt watched. So I stopped and surveyed my surroundings, and to the east of me, about 25 yards in the thick underbrush, something quite robust in size and dark in color seemed to be crouched between a couple of trees looking in my direction. I thought it was a large hog, or maybe a bear, so I turned south heading toward home, and this creature moved along with me, keeping a distance of approximately 15 to 30 yards between us at all times. We continued this kind of cat and mouse routine for about 20 to 25 minutes. I stopped to relieve myself, then suddenly I don't know what possessed me to turn into the woods and towards this creature. It stopped and crouched very low to the ground and remained perfectly still. I had gotten to within about 10 yards, and I got wind of a strange odor I can't describe. I heard a low guttural growl coming from the creature's area. I could see it was very dark in color and almost lying in a prone position, much like a sniper lining up a shot. It had human-like legs, only very hairy. I could make out thick arms and shoulders, also covered with thick hair, probably no more than one to two inches in length. It was down almost as if it was trying to hide its face. I would estimate it to be no more than six feet tall. The hair on the back of my neck stood up when I heard movement of something large moving in the woods across the trail behind me. I moved quickly back to the trail and it seemed I wasn't being followed, so I slowed my pace. By this time, I was about 100 to 125 yards from the point I had urinated. I turned and saw this dark figure walk upright out of the east woods and stop at my puddle area. It squatted for a few seconds, then stood up and looked directly at me for a few more seconds. Its head turned abruptly toward the west woods, and a much larger dark being came slightly into view. They both watched me as I backpedaled watching them for another dozen or so yards, then I decided home was the best place to be and ran off. Over the next three years of living in that area, I would often feel being watched when I was outdoors. Loud crashing sounds from the woods, times of no animal activity, and all my dogs growling fearfully towards the woods. We would hear the occasional chattering and screams, smell foul odors, and sticks and debris would come flying from the woods, and even I shine one evening about eight feet from the ground. A neighbor at the time said she heard grunts and groans some nights, and her dogs would shake. A little background on me. I'm 57 and have had a lifelong passion for deer hunting, trapping, and fishing. I've spent hundreds of hours camping, scouting, and hunting the western states 
pursuing my passion. I spent 11 years in the USMC recon, most of which as a scout sniper. I was involved in many missions all over the Middle East and Africa and Serbia and saw a lot of combat and horrible things. I can handle myself in the woods or anywhere else. My son is also a very passionate outdoorsman. A hunter found you on YouTube and convinced me that I needed to write to you and tell you my story. He is one of only a few people I have ever told, but he knows my word is the only thing that matters to me, so if I said it, it happened. I watched some of the TV shows and heard some broadcasters and personalities who all seem to think this is some sort of joke. I wonder how much time they spent in the woods, or how much time they spent with mortars going off around them, and 762 AK-47 rounds were flying by their face. I wonder why their words would be more honest than mine. Douchebags. It was 2006. I was hunting in central Oregon on the east side of the Cascade Range, trying to kill a big blacktail. I had my base camp set up at about 4,000 feet in a small clearing about four miles from any road. I had spent the first two days scouting and found a buck that I wanted to try for, so on the third morning I set out half an hour before sunrise and started heading up the slope to a good spot where I could easily see a couple of meadows at first light. I got set up, leaned my rifle against the tree, and started wiping the dew off my binoculars and opened up a power bar. It was still a little too dark to see, so I started turning my eyes into the meadow while I ate my breakfast. I had made at least 20 do-it-yourself hunts in the western states in my life, but never to this particular area, as I have never killed a big blacktail, and this was supposed to be a good area. Not having the funding for an outfit or guide, I always went by myself on public land and had a good time. So, first light comes, and I start glassing the meadow. I heard some noise off to my left, the west. It sounded like something was coming up the ridge. It was going to come out in a small neck that fed into the meadow. I turned and got my rifle up, assuming it was a deer. I can see movement in the brush about a hundred yards to my west, but the brush was thick enough I couldn't make it out, but could tell it was not a deer. Eventually, I could make out that it was upright, so I assumed it was another hunter. He got to the edge of the meadow and stood there, kind of crouching behind some bushes. I'm getting a little pissed off, as someone else has got in the same area I was in. I hadn't seen a soul in two days. I scouted for any human tracks. I rose up slowly and whistled at the guy, waving my right arm over my head, letting him know, hey, there's a hunter here, go somewhere else. He immediately wheeled to his right to face me directly. When he did that, I could see he was immense across the shoulders. I thought, holy Christ, I'm six foot two and 220 pounds. He made me look like a child. As soon as he saw me, even though it was dimly lit, I could tell we were looking at each other, and he ducked down in the bushes. I thought, what the hell? So I set my rifle back against the tree and stepped out into the meadow so he could get a clear look at me. I started walking towards him. I want to hunt this area. I want him to go somewhere else. There was plenty of time for him to leave and do that. I took about five steps, and he stood up again. This time, I could tell it was not a man. It was just too damn big and covered in hair. He started grunting at me and shaking the bushes in front of it. My rifle was still leaning against the tree where I had originally sat. I raised my binoculars up and looked at his face. I can't tell you a ton of details. I was totally startled, but he had dark hair, certainly all over what I could see, except for the face. There was a lot of flesh, a broad forehead, broad nose, big lips, a huge set of shoulders and chest. I couldn't see his legs very well because of the brush. But I have spent countless hours looking through binoculars and a rifle scope. I know exactly what I'm looking at when I'm looking. This was no man, and it was no ape, and it was no joke. It was no dumbass in a ghillie suit either. The whole instant only took a matter of minutes, but it never stopped grunting, growling, and shaking the bushes at me. Though it never came out in the clearing or toward me any further, it certainly made me feel like it did not want me there, and I was in danger. He was downhill from me, so it was hard for me to get a judge on his height, but the bushes were clearly four to five feet tall, and it was well above those. I'm going to guess it a good seven or eight feet tall, with shoulders a good four feet across, with massive arms and head that were also massive in proportion to a human. I was within 95 yards of this thing, with a clean line of sight looking through quality optics. 
I've never seen anything like it before or since, and I do not ever want to see another one. It was a truly spooky deal. I instinctively backed up. I picked up my rifle, shouldered it, and centered the crosshairs on his face. It stared at me intently and very menacing. It would have been an easy shot. Still, something told me inside not to shoot. Something told me it was absolutely the wrong thing to do. So I held my rifle up with my right hand and raised my left hand over my head and looked at him in submission. I didn't know what else to do. I slung my rifle, picked up my backpack, and headed back down the trail to camp, never looking back. I never heard him or saw him again. I got back to my tent and packed up everything, headed down to the truck, went to town. I stayed the night in town. In the morning, I drove to a new hunting area, 35 miles to the north, to finish out my trip. I didn't want to waste my tag or waste my Bible vacation, so I tried my best play. I ended up unsuccessful in filling my tag that season, and yes, I was rattled the whole time. I've only told my family and a few close friends my story. My son believes me. I don't know if anyone else does or doesn't. I don't really care. I've got nothing to prove to anyone. I know what I saw, and as I said, a man's word should be enough. It's been almost 14 years. I relive it every single day. I cannot get it out of my mind. Everything that goes bump in the night, what makes a sound in the woods, gets my immediate attention. Isn't that crazy? Especially after what I've been through. Retired cop talks about his frightening truck stop encounter. I was a cop for 27 years. I approach things with open-minded cynicism. In other words, I like evidence. I want to be able to see it, touch it, feel it, test it, and then make my decision. Anyway, I retired from the department three years ago. I'm from northern Arizona. I've been around black bear, mountain lion, coyote, wildcat, and even a wolf. I have hunted most things in North America that can hunt you. I also worked gangs and narcotics for 20 years and worked around and against human predators that can and will hunt you. I'm not given to flights of fancy or unreasonable fear. I'm not saying I was never afraid. You'd have to be an idiot to not be afraid when you're getting ready to breach a door knowing there are armed men on the other side who would rather kill you than go back to prison. But I never let that fear stop me from doing what I had to do. So, I retired from my department just over three years ago, and after a while, decided I needed a second career. I taught school for a semester and really didn't like it, and on a fluke, my best friend and competitive shooting buddy said, let's go to truck driving school. So we did. My buddy and I drove as a team and spent all of last winter in the mountain states, seemingly running from Phoenix, Arizona, near where I live, to Shelby, Montana. We used to overnight in Barrett's, Montana, at a Sinclair station that had a cafe, a small store, and a parking lot for about 20 semis. It was a regular stop for us, so I am and was familiar with the area. We stopped this night, and I was in the driver's seat, and my buddy was sitting on the lower bunk in the sleeper. We had a movie on the DVD player, and I was paying half attention to that and half attention to my laptop when I caught some movement past the driver's window. Bear in mind, this is a small facility, and it is a hundred yards from the freeway, but generally surrounded by a large field with three to four foot tall grass and thickets that go right into foothills and mountains. I looked to the mirror and saw the biggest, presumed man I had ever seen step behind my trailer, which was 70 feet behind me. I said, Jesus, that was the biggest motherfucker I've ever seen. Damn. My buddy popped up and looked out the passenger window and said, no shit, and told me he saw a big guy walk between the space between the rear of our trailer and a truck that was parked next to us. I didn't think anything more of it for a while, but then I realized that when I caught the movement next to me, the head of the guy was nearly at my shoulder level, which was 10 feet off the ground. I was in my 2019 Freightliner Cascadia tractor. The bottom of the window line on my door is 9.5 feet from ground level. My cop brain went into assessment mode, and I thought, no, he couldn't have been that tall. There must have been a shadow casting on my window. I wasn't even considering Sasquatch. I was in what do I know and what does the evidence tell me mode, but I was tired and put it out of my mind. 
I finished up, and my partner and I went to our bunks and killed the TV and lights. The only noise was my APU running to keep the heater running. I fell into a very light sleep, which was unusual because I usually sleep like a baby. I'm totally comfortable in my truck, but not this night. It's like I felt like I was hovering between sleep and wakefulness. Around midnight, I really had to pee. Since the store and cafe was already closed by nine, I climbed out of the passenger side of my tractor to check the chains. Pee between the tractor and trailer near the snow chain hooks. The truck that had been parked next to us was already gone, so the space was open from my truck to the grass field. For some reason, I felt like I was being hunted, watched. Maybe not actively hunted like prey, but definitely I was aware of something predatory being aware of me. I've been hunted by criminals, I've been around predatory animals, and I have never felt like this before. I finished quickly and looked around and scanned the grass field in the quarter moonlight and had a feeling, a deep down feeling, that I should not move toward the field. It was like a pheromone instinct that signaled that danger existed if I did. Like all the hardwired primal instincts of survival just told me not to move in that direction. Then I heard oomph. Not like someone hit someone in the gut, but just a low verbalization of oomph. I got back in the truck and locked the door. I felt like there was something out there that was dangerous, but only if I did something to trigger an aggressive response. I got into my bunk and made sure that my Glock 10 millimeter pistol was in the cubby by my head. Being a retired police officer, I can legally carry in all 50 states, but I also made sure two spare magazines were close to hand as well. In the time I had been trucking, I had never felt as though I had to do that, not even when parked in downtown Detroit. Something was telling every fiber of my being that there was something out there that was, well not aggressive, it was dangerous. I tried to put it out of my mind and listen to a podcast while trying to go back to sleep. I slept a little bit, but I had a sense of foreboding. At 3 a.m. I sat bolt upright, reaching for my Glock. I saw it, whatever it was, go by the front of the truck this time, in the space between the building and my truck. I moved out of my bunk to the passenger side window, and only caught a faint and fading shadow moving into the darkness out of the faint glow of the low-sodium lighting on the building 75 yards away. I was up now, and there was no way I was going back to sleep. I got out my coffee maker and started a pot of coffee and got dressed. I still had 90 minutes on my electronic log before I could go back on duty and drive us out of there, but all I wanted to do was to leave ASAP. I drank my coffee and kept looking out of the window of the truck, but didn't see anything else. The sun started coming up, and with the light, the sense of foreboding retreated. I could see all around the truck and the few other trucks parked in the lot and out in the grass field and up to the building. My buddy asked from the top bunk why I was up so early. I literally had an extra day and a half more than we needed to drop the load we were hauling, so we had planned to do a 34-hour reset at Barrett's. I told him what I had felt all night, and he quietly said, Me too. When the sun was fully up, I walked all around the places where I had seen it. I was using my cop brain again and realized that the hard-packed gravel would hold no tracks, especially as cold as it was. I walked to the edge of the grass field, and while there was a trail. It was a game trail where I'm sure deer moved through, so there were no large footprints visible. When the cafe opened for breakfast, my buddy and I went in to eat a meal. We didn't cook in the truck microwave and tried to figure out what we had experienced and seen. I am firmly convinced that I saw a Sasquatch. I took the known and the unknown and the puzzle pieces, put it into one logical assumption that could be made. At any rate, we decided to put a day of driving between us and Barrett's and get to a larger, more populated truck stop or terminal to do our 34-hour reset. Sean Francisco, Florence, Arizona. My name is Andrew. I'm 32 years old, engaged, and a father of five. I live in southwest Washington State, not far from Mount St. Helens. My number one passion is hunting big, old, smart blacktails. I also archery hunt elk, as well as rifle hunt predators. Unfortunately, we can no longer run dogs. However, I have experience with dogs. 
I was, for a few short years, a big game hunting guide in northern Idaho. Hound hunting predators, as well as guiding archery and rifle deer and elk hunts. It was the fall of 2019, after close to 25 years in the woods, I saw something that has left me stressing every time I have to hike in the dark, going in or coming out of the mountains. It was rifle deer season, and I was hunting a massive 4 by 4 that I had seen the previous year. The only downside is, that buck lives in the middle of nowhere. From my house to the beginning of the logging road is a 30 minute trip, then it's an hour drive up the logging road to the very end of a certain drainage main line. Then it's an eight mile bike or hike to where I want to hunt this buck. In order to get all the way up to where I want to be by daylight, I have to start my bike or hike a couple of hours before daylight. It was on this trip up the trail that I saw something I've never seen before. The weather was rainy and drizzly, as well as thick coastal fog rolling in and out. I had reached a point in the trail where I wanted to walk, as it was a very large patch of big timber with a long, flat stretch of trail that has a major game trail intersecting. I have seen animals cross at that point many times. There was enough light that I could see approximately 200 yards. I was slowly pushing my mountain bike with my left hand and holding my 270 with my right. As I turned my head from looking off to my right, I looked straight down the trail at the point where the game trail intersects and saw a seven to eight feet tall, massive stature being, black in color, walking in a steady stride across the trail, looking at me the entire time. The one detail that stands out the most, more than its size, color, or even threat level, was how long its arms were, well below the knees, with a significant constant sway in motion with each step. I froze in awe and shock at what the hell I had just seen. I didn't move for several minutes. I was by myself, however, I wasn't scared of leaving. To be honest, it was like my brain couldn't really comprehend what I just saw, so I started telling myself anything to explain it away. Oh, it was just a bear. Maybe it was a real wet deer or elk. It could have been a hunter in dark clothing without orange on. I finally felt assured it was something else other than what I had just seen and continued on. I walked up to the point where the being crossed the trail, thinking I would see a deer or bear tracks to explain it away. However, there were no tracks or anything. The ground was a hard orange brown clay. However, it was raining, and surely if anything on hoof or anything with claws walked there, it would have left a track. I looked and looked and found nothing as far as tracks. The sighting lasted literally seconds. However, it was long enough for me to tell that there was no way in hell it was a bear, elk, human, cat, or deer. I have successfully killed every forementioned species with many of each species. I have hunted, fished, camped, and worked in the woods for close to 25 years. I have seen some things in nature that most people simply would not believe it could happen, involving known species, bear, elk, deer, bobcat to be exact, but I have never seen anything like what I saw that day. The more I replayed in my mind what happened, I am convinced I saw a Bigfoot. I feel very awkward even typing this. I have only told three people what I saw that day. Two are my friends and hunting partners, and one is an uncle who I have looked up to and inspired me to hunt since I was a kid. All three of them literally laughed and gawked at me and told me how there's no proof. No game trail videos, no bones, no bodies. So, I've never brought it up with anyone since. Not even my wife or children. I have accepted what I've seen, and I'm at ease with accepting it. What I saw is what many would call Bigfoot. I know what I've seen. Nobody can tell me differently. I don't even try to convince people at all. I know, and that's the bottom line. September 2015, Northwest Colorado, California Park, right on the other side of Sand Mountain, an 11,000-foot peak from Steamboat Lake, scouting elk early September just before muzzleloading for my fall rifle hunt. My son, 15 at the time, and I, 38 years old. I am an experienced big game hunter with 12 years as a professional guide, experience hunting big game in northwest Colorado, elk, bear, mule deer, cougar, antelope. We are camped at the entrance to California Park, coming from the Hayden, Colorado entrance. This is my backyard. I've lived here for 20 plus years. 
At around 10 a.m., my son and I set up camp at the government corrals on top of California Park. Anyone familiar with the country knows what I'm talking about. At around 1 p.m., we struck out for some scouting to find recent game activity in the area. Being familiar with the area, we set out on a couple-mile hike. We had lunch in the woods, after a few miles, and headed back to camp. After returning to camp, I was tired and took a nap. My son was at the back of the truck in the cooler making a sandwich. As I slept, all of a sudden, a huge rock, literally the size of a bowling ball, landed 15 feet from the back of my tent. It startled me to the 10th power. I came out with my Glock drawn to see the aspen tree behind my tent still shaking from being hit with the rock. There is absolutely no explanation for it. We were alone on the mountain. Blew it off after looking around as just a freak thing. Later that night we had a campfire. We were in the same spot. Hit the rack around 10 p.m. Around 2 a.m. it was completely calm weather-wise and I was sound asleep. All of a sudden, a very large tree came crashing down about 50 yards from the tent to the northeast of us. Absolutely scared the shit out of me. Pitch black, no moon, no wind, freaking crazy. After about 10 minutes, I finally got my heart rate back under control and laid down again. I was notching it up to some freak thing again. It wasn't two minutes later, an incredibly loud howling kind of noise came roaring from the woods about 20 yards to our north. This is thick alpine mountain environment. Wouldn't have been able to see what it was if it was daylight, much less than 2 a.m. It proceeded to do this several more times. Then about a hundred yards to our south, there was a freaking reply to this thing that sounded almost identical. I was in the process of shitting my pants while I drug my half-asleep son to the truck in a total panic. We jumped in the truck and I fired it up and honked the horn to try to scare them away. I drove the truck in circles, trying to get the headlights on whatever it was. Didn't ever see it. After about ten minutes, I turned the truck off. Literally, for the rest of the night, I sat in my truck with my Glock in my lap, and my window cracked, listening to tree knocks in the distance. My Glock is a Smith & Wesson forty cal It's a badass weapon. I did not feel safe. Packed up at daylight and have not been to California Park and Route National Forest in northwest Colorado since. I now live near Yellowstone, and I'm more comfortable dealing with grizzly bears than those freaking things. They are real. That's not the only time I've been around them, but that's the scariest one for sure. Peace. I have a couple of experiences to share. I'm from Marquette County in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. I was 12 years old at the time of the first one. About five or six friends and I were in the neighborhood we grew up in. We were on a dead-end street that was up on a high ridge, and I was looking across a gully at another ridge that was about a quarter mile away. I noticed a dude jogging along the hillside, which was strange because there was a trail at the top, and where he or it was jogging, it was steep, rough terrain covered in leaves from the hardwood trees. I pointed him out to my friends and said, Hey, look at that dude in the white jogging suit over there. It was all white from head to feet, hands, everything white. We all just thought it was a dude jogging until we saw it leap up a ledge that looked impossible for a person to accomplish. At that point, we all started saying, Holy shit, did you see that? It's a Bigfoot. We all ran up the ridge we were on so we could keep sight of it for as long as possible. That thing covered some serious ground on some nasty terrain like nothing. After about five minutes of watching, it finally crested the hill and we lost sight. The next day after school, we went to the ledge. We went up to see how high it was, and if I'm lying, I'm dying. It was about eight feet tall. That was confirmation enough that that wasn't some dude in a white jogging suit, but had to be a Bigfoot. The second sighting happened about three years later. I was around 15 years old. My two friends and I were sitting up on a power line ridge smoking cigarettes and shooting the shit and about 400 yards away I noticed a tree that looked like a dude squatting down looking at us. I pointed it out and we all chuckled about it because it did look like someone. A week or two prior to this a dog from the neighborhood we lived in went missing. Well all of a sudden that dog or one that looked just like it shows up by that tree and starts bouncing in circles around it and we all look at each other like, what the fuck? 
and that solid brown tree stood up straight, turned away from us, and walked straight into the tree line. Again, we all at the same time said, It's a Bigfoot. Its mannerisms were weird. It didn't even look at the dog. It just turned sideways and walked away, arms a swinging with the dog following right behind. It never looked back. That dog never did return home to its owners, and we didn't mention seeing it either. Thank you. My name is Sid Autry. I'm a disabled veteran and served six years in the U.S. military. I'm from Northeast Tennessee, and I was raised in Southwest Virginia. Around 1999 or 2000, my wife and son and I owned a place in southwestern Virginia outside of Bristol, Virginia, and Tennessee. We lived there for around 10 years before we moved on to Tennessee. We had a dog that was part husky, and I don't know what, and he was huge. His back came above my knees and just below my waist, and he weighed around 125 pounds or more. He liked to kill groundhogs and would bring them to the door and sit until I acknowledged him. I loved that dog. I can say that I never knew of that dog backing down or being afraid of anything except one time. Where we lived was out in the country and was remote enough that we would have to drive 20 minutes to town. There's a place called Gum Hill that isn't far from where we lived, and the old folks would tell you of something there they call the wood booger. There's a video of a Bigfoot crossing a creek in front of a four-wheeler that has been on TV, and Moneymaker and his crew came in to do whatever they do. That place was just a mile or more from my house. Here's that video clip. One night, my dog had gotten agitated and was throwing a fit. I went outside to calm him and see if I could see what was making him so agitated. He was on the front porch, and as I opened the door, he ran to me. I had my gun and walked down the steps out into the yard with my dog beside me. As we came up to the creek and just out of the range of the house lights, he reacted fierce. There was a smell that hit me that I have never smelled since it before. I can't describe it but the closest I can get is that it smelled dead and skunky and like a wet dog all at the same time. And it was so strong that it pushed me away from it. But my dog was barking and showing his teeth like he was going to go fight something. As I backed up a little, because I didn't want to get sprayed by a skunk, my dog took off. He hit the creek wide open and was across it in a blink. He was throwing a fit, and then he yelped and came running back. That dog was terrified. He was trying to get between my legs and was shaking. I backed up and had my weapon up ready to fire if something came out and walked backwards to the house and to the safety of the light. My dog ran to the front door and was clawing at the door to get in, even though he never came inside. I stayed outside waiting to hear something or see something, but never did. All that was there was that awful smell. Then it just went away. It never came back and I never found out the source of it. My dog ran into the house and went under a table beside my bed and wouldn't come out until the next day, and I had to drag him out then. I've never experienced anything like that before or since. I asked around from neighbors to see if they had noticed or seen anything, and that's when I learned of the wood booger. Whatever scared my dog did something that nothing else ever did, and I sure never wanted to find out, but I have a pretty good idea of what happened that night. This witness was out in the forest late one night when he had an encounter. He says, So I started walking down the mountain to where I was sure our campsite was. I started to feel like I was being followed and watched. I started hearing sticks break in the distance. I started getting a little spooked, so I told myself to go to where the road was. I knew it was on my right side, so I started heading to my right. Heading that way for a while, I wasn't seeing the road. I started getting nervous. I stopped by this large tree and looked around me to get my bearings. About a minute later, I hear this heavy, deep grunt, and it's close. I almost felt it like it was on the other side of the tree. My first thought was that it was a bear. I stood very silent and listened, 
My mind kept racing. Maybe it's a mountain lion. Maybe my friends are messing with me. So it felt like an eternity, but I didn't hear anything else. So I decided to just start moving. I slowly and as quietly as I could started walking away. I honestly didn't look around because of how scared I was. As I was walking away from the tree, I heard brush and sticks kind of wrestling back and forth. I pulled out my phone and turned on the flashlight. I turned around and shined it in the direction of the noise. The noise stopped when I raised the flashlight. I didn't see anything. I started to make noise, yelling, Hey! And I picked up a rock and threw it towards some bushes. When the rock hit the tree, I instantly felt this booming growl. I don't really know how to describe it, but it was deep and loud, and I felt it in the bottom of my stomach. I remember saying out loud, Oh, fuck! because I really thought it was a bear about to charge or something. With my flashlight out in front of me, I started slowly looking around in that direction. Barely out of flashlight's reach, I could see this figure standing halfway out from behind this tree. I'm fixed on it and trying to figure out if it's my imagination, or if it's a tall mass of man looking at me, and I hear this deep breathing, like someone had just run a marathon. I thought about turning off my flashlight to see if I could see it better when my eyes adjusted to the dark, but I was too nervous. Just about that time, I saw an arm come up and around the front of the tree, almost like he was hugging the tree. I knew this wasn't my imagination anymore. This was someone looking at me. I've never felt fear like I did in that moment. I honestly felt like who or whatever this was wanted to do me harm. I started thinking about my newborn baby and how I thought I was never going to hold her again and I'd never see my wife again and all these thoughts came shooting through my mind, and about that time I see this giant, man-like Bigfoot step out from a tree and walk from right to left. He was about 20, maybe 30 feet from me. I could not believe how massive this thing was. I saw him in such great detail that there was no possible way this could have been a bear or monkey or a guy in a costume or anything. I could see muscles, and he had longish, brownish gray hair, and he was massive. I have a friend that's a bodybuilder, and he's six foot two and huge, but this thing was beyond human size. He was about seven to maybe eight feet tall and just giant. Broad shoulders, and his arms swung when he walked. His hands were fists, and they went down to about his knees. I was so terrified that I started shaking, and I have never done that. I remember he turned and looked right at me, right before he disappeared behind another tree and I knew he stopped walking because the footsteps stopped. His footsteps were so powerful, I stood there shaking, not knowing what to do. Let me tell you that I've been around a bear before. When I was younger, me and my dad came across a bear, and I was scared, but not like this. This had such a drowning effect. It almost felt like he just sucked all the air out around you, and you couldn't move. I knew that if I were to run, he would just catch me in a matter of seconds. I always carry a pocket knife, but I didn't feel at all like that would do anything to protect me. It felt like such a long time just standing there waiting for something to happen. Then I heard a car. It was somewhere behind me. I didn't even think about it. I just remember I turned and started running toward the sound of the car. As soon as I turned, I saw headlights driving down the canyon road. I remember running so fast I was afraid of tripping on something, and I knew that if I fell, that that would be it. I remember kicking my knees up to my chest as I ran to make sure I didn't trip. Honestly, all I thought about when I was running was, please God, let the car see me. I started yelling at the top of my lungs and bolted towards the car. I've never ran faster in my life. I came close to the road, but not seeing the hill down towards the road. I completely lost my balance and fell down the hill towards the road. I remember a pop in my collar when I hit the road. I got up just thinking that that thing was right behind me. The car had already driven past, but I started running down the road. I knew I had broken something, my collarbone. I kept running and running, praying that thing didn't come grab me. I never stopped. Another car finally passed again, and I stopped it. It was a woman and a man. They asked if I was all right. I was so exhausted that I basically collapsed. They took me to the little ranger station area at the mouth of the canyon where a ranger went up and got my friends. They came down and were so surprised seeing me the way I was. All of it was a blur when the couple found me. 
When the lady and man found me, I was so distressed I was crying and breathing so hard. I don't remember them asking me anything, and I was too overwhelmed to tell them anything. When my friends got to me, I tried to regain my composure, but I just lost it again and started crying uncontrollably. My best friend took me by himself to the hospital, and I told him what happened. I was shaking so bad that he had to pull over and calm me down. I got my bone aligned in the hospital, and my wife came to pick me up. I told her what happened that night, but I feel like I just can't describe it well enough. I really just am trying to get this off my chest, and hopefully get some closure or something. I don't know. I just wanted to write in and tell my account, thank you for your time. Two Different Roadside Sightings The witness Eric was returning home one night with some business associates when he saw a creature on the side of the road. Eric says, As we drove by, I was about six feet away from this thing, looking up at it. This event happened several years ago, and Eric decided to start looking into the topic. Several years later, he had a close daytime visual and writes, He stretched straight up, his eyes grew wide, he paused for a second, then turned to the right, my left, took a step and dropped down off the bank, disappearing. It had a large head with very predominant facial features. It had no facial hair and very little neck. It had a short forehead with the head sloping back. It had dark eyes, large cheekbones, and a wide, flat nose. The mouth was wide with what looked like thin lips. The shoulders were at least 48 inches wide, and the chest was hairless, from the chest to the waist wasn't straight down, as its body was built like a bodybuilder's and came to the waist in a V-shape. The hair was a darkish brown red, and the skin color was also dark, that of a Native American or Middle Eastern culture. As it turned, it stepped with the left leg leading the step it took with every bit of six feet, before dropping down and disappearing. As I mimic the movement and speed, we put the sighting at five to six seconds. We averaged the distance from where I was to where it stepped out to around 100 yards. We returned the following day, August 23, 2015, and followed the channel back to where it stepped out. I'm six foot one and the brush was about chest high to me, and I saw it from its head to its waistline. We did find a trackway up to the spot it was seen with a matted down area where it stood. We also found a print that was 16 inches long from the back heel by 10 inches wide from the outside edge of the big toe to the outside edge of the little toe that we did cast. A female and a baby. My name is Jeff and I'm from the very southern tip of Ohio. I'm an honorably discharged Navy veteran I served during the Persian Gulf conflict. If you were to talk to anyone who knows me, they'd tell you that I do not lie about anything. In 1986, I had gone deer hunting in an old coal strip mine area that is now part of the Wayne National Forest in Gallia County, Ohio. There have been many encounters with these things reported since the early 1800s in and around Gallia County. Well, this is what happened to me. It was bow season, 1986. I'm not sure of the exact date. Still, I had scouted this area since early September and had built a few of the old-fashioned deer stands in a patch of woods that probably spanned two miles in each direction. There were a few old strip mine roads and two old strip mine ponds. I tried to alternate between the tree stands going to a different one each day that I hunted. On this particular day, I decided to go to the stand that was maybe 40 to 50 yards away from one of the old ponds. I got to the tree stand around 5 a.m. It was still dark, cold, and foggy. When the sun finally started to break, the fog started rolling back. I started hearing a buzzing sound, and I thought to myself, there can't be any bees' nests in this tree, especially as cold as it was. All of a sudden, I caught a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye. At first, I thought it was a black bear. Still, as it broke through the fog, I made out what it really was. She was maybe six to seven feet tall. She was carrying a baby, and the whole time she was humming and looking at the baby. I don't know if it was a newly born baby or if it was sick. Still, she walked to the edge of the pond, got a scoop of water in her hand, and either gave it to the baby or wiped him off. But as quickly as she appeared, she turned and walked away through the thickest briar patch. After that, I didn't hear the buzzing or humming anymore. 
I feel that she was so into taking care of the baby that she didn't notice me sitting up in the tree stand. This is probably one of the most uneventful encounters that have been sent to you, but still, it's absolutely true they do exist, and I know it to be fact. I knew I was being watched. My name is Doug. I'm a retired Minnesota game warden and pilot. My patrol area was in the northeastern part of the state, which is mostly wilderness. In the 1980s, I was patrolling a vast lake in my patrol area on a very nice day. I decided to tie the boat up on shore and walk across a peninsula to observe any fishing activity in the next bay. I spotted a man still fishing in a boat about a hundred yards out from me. I concealed myself and sat down. He did not move once. I put my binoculars on him to see what was up. Within a moment, he started fidgeting and looking all around. He had his back to me and turned and looked directly at me. I was completely hidden, so he did not hear or see me. He started his boat and came to shore about 30 yards down the hill from me and started looking around under brush and behind trees. I thought that he must have hidden a pile of fish somewhere and decided to let him pick it up before I picked him up. He looked from side to side, back to where I was, and all around. After a few moments of this, I realized he was looking for me. I was startled by this, but also curious. As he walked around and started to get further away, I mentally told him to come back, and he did so, each time until he walked up to the brush in front of me, spread it apart, and looked me right in the eye. I said, how you doing? And he said, I knew someone was watching me. I said, have a seat and let's talk. We soon discovered that we were both army vets, and he said that he found he had that skill while in Vietnam, and it saved his ass many times. I have felt this sixth sense work many times while working, and also took it as a warning. Get the hell away and find another route. What this guy did was terrific. He knew I was not dangerous. I forgot to check his fishing license. After a feat like that, a handshake was more in order. Jump ahead 30 years or so. A group of us outdoor types shot sporting clays, and we were sitting on the dock of the clubhouse, and the subject of Bigfoot came up. I mentioned that I had doubts about any primate living in the wild in Minnesota in the winter because they lose body heat too fast, and the calories needed would not be obtainable. We do get minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit and colder here. My teammate spoke up and said he had seen one. He managed a mining supply company and was traveling between towns and had to take a leak. He pulled off on a side road close to where his hunting shack is and stopped by a power line. As he was doing this, he looked down the hill to a small swamp and saw a huge figure pulling cattails out. After a moment, the figure stopped, turned around, and looked at him. It then ran to a poplar tree, hid behind it, and looked at him from side to side, not realizing that its shoulders were four times the width of the tree. Nobody in the group said a word. Three of us were retired law enforcement, and some were loggers or miners, and log cabin builders all outdoorsmen. I broke the silence and asked where he was exactly when this happened. He said, right near Eveleth, Minnesota, close to me and one of our coldest towns. I have never seen or found a sign of a Bigfoot during my working years, and if I had, I would have kept my mouth shut until retirement. My friend said that it spooked him, and he told no one except his wife and hunting shack partner. It was trying to get in the door. I'm an ex-combat vet who served five tours in Iraq and Afghanistan and was wounded twice. It has been almost 14 years. When I came back home in 2011, I was stationed at Fort Leavenworth one night in January 2012. I was on guard detail at a medium-sized perimeter station, concrete walls two feet thick, and a solid steel blast door a foot thick, just about a half mile from the Missouri River. My comrade stepped out to smoke. This was around midnight and in a snowstorm. He started banging on the door within a minute of being outside. I opened the door and like, what the fuck, you just went out there. He's like, there's something out there and it's not a man and it's not an animal. He heard it screaming at him, but he didn't see it. So I stepped out with him. We could hear something big, very big, just inside the woods about a hundred feet away. Then we heard a screaming roar. We both went back inside and locked the door. 
Within minutes, the thing started banging on the door with such force. It took me back to combat, ready in a flash. We looked at each other and the monitors on the station, and we could see only the top of its head. Long story short, we finally opened the door after it took off, found dents in the solid metal door. Yes, it still freaks me out. We also found footprints in the snow, 21 inches long. They led over the perimeter fence, which is 15 feet high with razor wire, headed towards the river. I'm a very rational person, but I had to share this. I have never told anyone except my comrade, who was on duty with me that night. It changed both of us to this day. Michael. It tore the cabin up. In 1967, I was 10 years old and had gone trapping with my grandfather on the Groundhog River in northern Ontario. He had built a couple of cabins along the river to serve as stopovers as he made his rounds. We arrived at the cabin, which was deepest in the bush, only to find our cabin completely ransacked by what we at least thought, not having heard of Sasquatch at the time, were bears. For years, I put off the strange things I saw that day as merely the incredible abilities of a hungry and curious bear. But today, armed with the knowledge of Sasquatch in retrospect, it could only have been Sasquatch. I should have guessed by the puzzled look and awkward silence from my grandfather that this was no ordinary bear b and &E. The door had been ripped off and was found in a clearing a couple of hundred yards down the trail. The wood stove, a cook stove that took three men to move, was found 500 feet up the trail. What was even stranger is that there were no drag marks anywhere between where it was originally sat and the clearing where it was found. Every jar lid, every container, every box had been opened. A case of wooden matches with 20 smaller boxes in it had been opened and every little box had also been opened. The two cot beds were never found, mattresses and all. Fortunately, the bunks had been left intact. One of the windows had a loose steel mesh over it with the squares being approximately one inch. It looked as if something had put its hand or paw in it and squeezed all the metal to the center. The list goes on. Things a bear could never do, but I was too young to realize. I never thought to look for tracks, but I am certain my grandfather did, being a master woodsman, which is probably why he did not mention it. That was the last year my grandfather went trapping often wondering if it was because of an encounter or simply old age. Another interesting story I'm certain you've never heard. In 1994, I was working in a healing center in Australia where they often had shamans or psychics come and do presentations, etc. A woman psychic had come, and as part of her presentation, she had asked a couple of the staff to put some pictures in unmarked envelopes so she could guess what they were. As one of the pictures, I put a sketch of a Bigfoot, that evening, as she successfully guessed her way through the envelopes, she came to my envelope. Immediately, her face went completely deadpan, dropping the envelope on the floor, and she said in a terrified voice, Someone must stop these beings. They are working with the ETs and disappearing people. She was very upset and refused to touch that envelope again. Sure enough, it was my Bigfoot pick. Make of that what you may. Dan Thanks for joining me on the Bigfoot Project. If you have a story you would like to share here, you can email me, Lynn Smith, at thebigfootproject at mail.com.